anyone with a passing familiarity with the women's rights movement in this country pretty much any time since the 1970s knows Judy Revick. She was a leading voice in the pro-choice movement for pay equity and on LGBT issues. She was a pundit, a journalist, and is founder of the progressive online platform Rabble.ca. But we learn a lot more about her in a new documentary on her life. For example, profound mental health difficulties she suffered and an abusive relationship in her past. It's all detailed in Judy vs. Capitalism, which screened at this year's Hot Dogs Festival and in October at the Rendezvous with Madness Festival. Plus, she's also released an autobiography called Heroes in My Head, a memoir. And Judy Rebick joins us now from the Annex in the provincial capital. You are multimedia all the time now, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, lately I have been all sitting in my living room. Well, good on you. It's, very, it's weird, but fun. <laughs> Let's start here, Judy. How much convincing did it take to get you to consent to having a documentary made about your life? Not much in this case, because Mike Holboom, who's the director, is a very close friend of mine, and I know that he's an incredibly talented filmmaker. So um, when he asked me, I asked a mutual friend, Velcro Ripper, also a filmmaker, and Velcro said, Mike asking to make a film about you is like a great painter asking to paint your picture, ah, paint your portrait. Nice. So, yeah, and so I said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Well, you wrote, didn't take much convincing. Right. You wrote the memoir not too long ago. So were there, were there things that the memoir could not cover that the documentary does? Um, no, it's not that it's not that the memoir, the book, the, the documentary was created quite separately from the memoir. I was writing the memoir while he was filming, while he was doing the interviews. So even though the book came out two years ago, um, uh, you know, film takes a long time to get going. Uh, I, um, the, 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 the interviews were just his interest in various things and not so much based on the book, but of course I was writing the book at the time. The one thing I talk about in the documentary that I don't talk about in the book is my struggles with weight. <laughs> Somehow that came up with him and it wasn't something that I decided to write about. So uh, we that's shall... about the only thing. <laughs> right. We shall get back to that. You know, the, the, the okay. funny thing is you've, um, like you've been on the scene in Canada for for so many decades, people people may think you're from here, but you're actually not. You grew up in mm. Reno, Nevada, which well, is. I grew up in. Yeah, sorry. So go ahead. I I was born in Reno, Nevada, but my parents moved back to New York. My father was stationed there during the war. My parents moved back to Brooklyn when I was about three months old. So I didn't grow up in Reno. I grew up in Brooklyn. Okay, that makes sense. In Toronto, because yeah. you really you scream New York. I have to tell you, as you know, but. Uh, <laughs> So you know, I, I left there when I was 10, but I'm, I'm really a Brooklyn Jew through and through. I know that. It's, really, it's kind of weird, but true. Well, t uh, uh, get, I'm, tr I'm trying to ask this in an appropriate way without, without having you get into, because I know there's an issue with your father that we're going to talk about eventually, but I don't want to touch on that yet. So maybe you can just give me the broad brushstrokes of what a childhood in Brooklyn, New York, for you was like. Well, I was... Um, we grew. Up, I grew up in Flatbush, which now is like little Jamaica in New, in New York, but then was all Jewish. And uh, until I was five, we lived in my grandma's basement. Um, so I spent a lot of time with my grandma, which was great. She really took care of me. I think more than I remember her more strongly than I do my mo my own mother. And um, you know, we had a very extended family in those days. Uh, I spent a lot of time with my cousins and my cousins' cousins, and that's what I remember most. School, we moved out of my grandma's house when I was about uh, uh, when I was five, and then we lived um, on our own, and that's when I started making more friends. Uh, and um, yeah, and you know, it, it was pretty, in some ways, uneventful. You know, you have Jewish holidays. My grandparents were very religious. So we practiced, my father not so much, we practiced all the religion. And also my father was a great baseball player. Like he was, um, he was, uh, they invited him to come onto the farm team of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Like I think he would have got, gotten onto the team, the Brooklyn Dodgers team. If, if not for the fact they didn't pay very much. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me, I mean, you, you would have lived pretty close to, uh, to Abbott's Field, right? In Flatbush. So did yes. you guys ever go That's to the right. ball games together? Every week. 
Hmm. We went Saturday to the to the Dodgers and Sunday watched my father play ball. So I was brought up with baseball. I can't stand it now, but I was brought up <laughs> <laughs> watching baseball. <laughs> well, okay. Now, now we get to the uncomfortable question that I was hinting at a moment ago, which is later in life you have you have come to understand that you and your father had a, a particularly distressing relationship. You want to touch on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, when I was in my 40s, my late 40s, I guess, yeah, 45, I, I, uh, something happened. It was in the middle of, uh, toward the end of the pro-choice struggle. And you might remember um, that there was a, a deaf woman in Toronto whose boyfriend, this is after abortion was legal, and her boyfriend tried to get an injunction to stop her from having an abortion. And her, and for some reason, um, that her sister freaked out and I was trying to calm her sister down. And for some reason it triggered memories. And I remembered, I, I remembered being abused as a child, as a little girl. And, um, I just, my m mind was just flooded with these memories. So I called someone I knew in the pro-choice movement who was a therapist and I knew she specialized in childhood sexual abuse. And I started uh, to go to her and, um, Within two sessions, I realized that the person abusing me was my father. And uh, and then about five sessions after that, um, this voice started speaking out of my mouth. I don't know if you want to talk about that now. but Well, um, in, in fact, you called it, I think, dis dissociative disorder. Is that part of it? Yeah. The, the medical term is dissociative identity disorder. But mm -hmm. back then, they called it multiple personality disorder, which most people know about because Hollywood's really sensationalized mm -hmm. it, right? Three Faces of Eve, you know, Sybil, Sybil. all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, that's not, that's not at all the experience that I had. But uh, so everybody knows that term. And in terms of my experience, that term makes more sense to me, but it's not used medically anymore. Do you think anybody else in your family knew what was going on in terms of the abuse at the hands of your father? No, uh, I don't think they knew, but you know, it's hard to tell because, you know, back in those days, even now it's true, but back in those days, you know, nobody talked about anything like that, you know, mm -hmm. like, and I, I told my grandmother, who's the person I was closest to that my father was making me touch him. And uh, my grandmother hit me and said, schmutz, which means dirt. Don't talk like that. Hmm. Right. So that was my attempt to tell somebody and didn't work. And so I had to protect myself. And the way I protect, this is how I see it. The way I protected myself was to create imaginary friends that took the abuse and hid it from me. That's how I experience it. The way that um, a psychiatrist would explain it is that a child under eight, and pretty, it's very rare, if ever, that someone develops this condition uh, if the abuse takes place later. There's something about the mobility of your brain that it can be this creative, that it creates these uh, these characters who take the abuse and hide it from, you know, because it's kind of unbearable. The person who's supposed to take care of you is abusing you. Mm. And so when you're five years old, you can't, like it's unbearable, you can't stand that. So so you dissociate from it and um, the problem, and it works worked very well. The problem was, um, you know, uh, it continued to be buried and continued to affect my health for many, many years until I could deal with it. How old was your father when he died? He was, I think he was 89. Yeah, in his did, late 80s. Did yeah. he ever face a day of reckoning on this issue? Well, I confronted him. Um, I, I had, I basically, when I was going through this, I was president of NAC, and I could do that, but I couldn't deal with talking to my father. So That's I cut this, off the, the National Action Committee on the Status oh, of Women. Yeah. Yes, yes. I cut off my uh, contact with my parents for two years. It turned out to be two years. I thought it would be a couple of months, but it turned out to be two years. And then I got an invite while I was president of NAC, which was a very major women's group. I got invited to speak at a national organization of women conference in Miami, and they lived in, Saint, in uh, Fort Lauderdale. And my brother uh, said he would go if I, as I wanted to. Con he, my brother wanted me to talk to my parents, and so uh, he said he would go, so he would be there to support me because he had been my primary support through all this. And at first I confronted my mother. I had no intention of confronting my father. And my mother accepted it at first. Um, but, you know, she was sort of um, 
a genius at, uh, you know, denial, right? Like uh, she denies she lived with this crazy guy. I mean, my father was really, I think he was, um, you know, a narcissist. He was, re- but he was very angry and he never, there was never violence, like physical violence in our home because his father beat him. So he never, he promised himself he'd never beat his wife or kids. But in this, in the world, he was quite violent. He get into fights in the baseball. Whoever saw anybody fighting a baseball diamond, you know, but my father did, you know. And uh, so she lived with that and pretended everything was okay. If you if you objected to his behavior, she'd say, "Oh, don't you know your father by now, right?" Hmm. So she did accept it, and she at first, and then she said, "Please, please confront your father. Please tell him." And my therapist didn't think I was ready to do that, but she was wrong. I went, and it was I think it was the most terrifying experience I ever had driving from my motel to their house, getting ready to confront him. But of course, by this time, he was a fragile old man. And so when the the altars, my therapist called them, the other personality saw him, they stopped being afraid of him. And, and I confronted him, and he denied it, but he denied it in a way that was very pro forma, you know? And um, and then my mother said, well, can't we all just put it behind us now? <laughs> that was my mother's way of dealing, right? Mm. And... Um, uh, yeah, so I didn't, I, and I could talk to my mother after that, but I didn't talk to my father much until they came back to Canada. So, yeah, so I did confront him, but he never accepted responsibility for it. Was it uh, at all satisfying to have that moment, though, of finally confronting him with that? Well, yeah, the way it was is that my altar stopped being afraid, so it enabled me to heal and to integrate them. Hmm. It was It was really a turning point in that way. Um, that they saw he couldn't hurt them anymore. Because every time one of them would come out in therapy, they say, where's Jack? That was my father's name. Where's Jack? You know. And uh, once they saw that he couldn't hurt me anymore, um, they just pretty well disappeared. And so it was really very profound. And also it was a profound healing moment because when I stepped, my, my brother saw that I was, I was starting to d- dissociate and turn into a little girl, you know, in front of their eyes, right? And because uh, it was so hard to do. And my brother saw that and he said, Judy and I are going to go now. And as soon as we stepped out the door, he put his arms around me and I had the probably the biggest cry I ever had in my life, hmm. letting it go. Yeah. So it was very healing that moment, even though disappointing. You know? Hmm. you know, one of the things as I was watching the documentary that occurred to me is I, I, I've known you for almost 40 years. Because oh, I've, wow. I, I've, because yeah. I've, I've covered all of your efforts to make, uh, to make progress on a whole host of issues that you've cared about, and, you know, and as I'm watching the documentary, I'm asking myself, all of this trauma and tragedy from her past, how has this had an impact on, you know, the rabble rousing social justice <laughs> crusader that she became? What do you think the answer to that is? I think the answer is a couple of things. One is I grew up in the 60s. The first one is so, you know, it was just like living and breathing to be a radical when I was a teen, when I was in university. So I think that's part of it for sure. But the other part is that because of what, I think because of what I went through, I I say this like the, the, the association gave me a kind of superpower, which was I was fearless. I never felt fear. I never even felt anxiety. Like nowadays, I feel anxiety, especially around COVID. And I say to people, how do you deal with it? Because I've never I've never felt anxious before. And they go, what? How could you not feel anxious? But I never did. And I never felt afraid either. So um, it was kind of a superpower. And it helped a lot in the pro-choice movement, as you'll remember. There was real violence in that movement, uh, people trying to stop us. And the other way is I think it made me much more empathetic. empathetic uh, because I was you know, hurt so badly as a child and because I had this experience of being different people in a way, I could understand better, I think, with more empathy what it would be like to be in a different skin, for example, or a different culture. Hmm. And so I think I was much more empathetic and that allowed me to get involved in anti-racist work and indigenous solidarity work well before most white people did. Right. Well, I you was mentioned able the to pro-choice. identify with those struggles. Yeah, you mentioned the pro-choice movement, and uh, we're going to show a snippet from the documentary because, well, here's Judy <laughs> Rebick at work, Sheldon, if you would. One day, I guess it was in the heat of the struggle, 
um, this guy came up to me. He was a pretty big guy, too. And he started, you know, yelling at me about killing babies, right? And then he put his hands on my throat and he started to push me. And I think he wanted to push me into the train. But the thing was that I had had some concerns about especially crossing the picket line and, you know, and violence, taking a Tai Chi course. And one of the great things about Tai Chi is that they teach you to take a stance so that nobody can push you. You know, you, you, you take the stance and the, you know, the Tai Chi instructor was a big guy, would try and push you with all his might and you get to the point where he can't move you. So I took my stance and the guy couldn't, he couldn't do it and I managed to get away from him when the train came and went into the train. Well, we're going to follow up on that story with another one because there was, a, you're laughing, but this, is, this was serious stuff. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. the, the man at the focus of the... I do look funny at going on the train, though. You would admit that it looks funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this way. The documentarian, <laughs> he's very artistic in the way he tells your story. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, indeed. The man at the focus of the pro-life, uh, pro, excuse me, pro-choice movement at the time uh, was um, an OBGYN named Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. And somebody came at him with a pair of... Um, what was it, a pair of scissors or a knife or something? Garden shears. Garden, Garden shears. shears. And you saved his life. Tell us that story. <laughs> well, uh, we, we were, the clinic was opening. Dr. Morgenthaler lived in Montreal, so he, we opened the clinic in the morning, for, really for the media. We didn't have any patients yet, and the media all took shots of me opening the door and, you know, up and down the stairs and opening doors on Harvard Street here in Toronto. And... Um, and Morgenthaler arrived from the airport at three in a taxi, and the taxi stopped across the street. And we escorted him across the street. We didn't expect any pr trouble, because if you remember, at that time, it was a conservative government, and the anti-choice thought the government would take care of it, and they didn't have to protest. That was at the beginning. So we didn't expect any trouble, but, you know, we, we did stand on either side of him just in case. And as we, in the middle of the street, this there was about a hundred media there and out of the media comes this guy. He walks right up to us, a middle-aged guy, and he grabs Dr. Morgenthaler with his arm. And I took his arm to pull it off because I realized he was up to no good. I didn't see the garden shears um, at first. And he had actually, his, he had garden shears in his right hand. It was left hand that I pulled it. He had garden shears in his right hand. Um, and I pulled him off Dr. Morgenthaler and Cheryl, the other person who was escorting him, took Morgan Tyler into the clinic. And then I saw that he had the garden shares and I just, you know, I just pushed him away and I said, get back, what are you doing, you know? And um, and then I start to chase him down the street. That was the crazy part, like taking care, <laughs> you know, defending him against Dr. Morgan Tyler, that part was my job. But then I followed him so I could find out where he lived and that was the crazy part. Yeah, what were you thinking there exactly? Had, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was just instant, you know, I got I to gotta see where he's going so the police can get him, you know, it was stupid. And Cheryl came out of the clinic to find me, and she yelled my name because she realized I was in shock, right? So I was not behaving rationally at that point. Hmm. So, yeah. The worst part of all of that, though, was to testifying at his trial. That was the hardest thing, I, one of the hardest things I've ever done because he looked so pathetic, you know. And so anyway, yeah. I didn't feel I really didn't feel anything until the next day. Like all that night, we don't talk. I don't say this in the film, but all that night I was doing media. You know, you can imagine it was a huge story, right? And then I was staying at a friend's house. So happened that night, and um, the next morning I just kept thinking, I have to go home. I have to go home. I have to go home. So like I said, I was in therapy. So I called my therapist and I said I, he hadn't seen. You know, it's not like now that everybody knows everything right away. He hadn't seen the news, so he didn't know what happened. So I explained it to him, and he said, well, you're in shock, Judy. You should go home and rest, you know? And then I started to cry, and I cried for quite a long time. And uh, I stayed home that day, and then went back to work. Hmm. <laughs> How would you characterize the state of your mental health today? Because you also tell us in the documentary you went through a terrible depression for a while as well. Yes. Um, I think Kai Chen, who's a, that's his Twitter handle, uh, her Twitter handle, sorry, her Twitter handle, um, who's a poet, she says marginalized people never really completely get over um, a trauma. And I think it's true for most people. If you're traumatized, you learn how to handle it. Uh, it gets better. 
but it's always there. So like at the beginning of COVID, for example, you know, facing, like I live alone, so facing being alone so much, and I, I started to go down into that hole. I know it, you know, it becomes familiar after a while. Yeah. And, but now I have the tools to um, stop myself, you know, and, and say, no, this is now, this is now, and I'm in a good place now. I'm safe, you know? And, uh, and so I've learned tools to deal with it. It's, the, the personalities have been integrated. I mean, the last time I can remember, I think one of them came out, because I'm never really sure. It was probably about eight years ago. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of depression, I think I'm always at a risk for depression, but I have, I have tools that I've learned to not let myself go down that path, if you want. Good. And so that's, that's how I've learned to handle it. And I also think I'm a nicer person now, actually. Hmm. I think I'm much more sympathetic. I'm less angry. Um, yeah, I, I, my, and politically I, I got more radical, not less radical. So. <laughs> well, s since I seem to be in the habit here of asking you very personal <laughs> questions, but, but they are all addressed in the documentary. So I, I hope you think they're all fair <laughs> so game. You, you think you have permission. Yes, well, a, a, a little bit of license. Yes. Let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me ask you another one. You never had kids, Judy. Do you ever regret the fact you never had kids? No. Because if I'd had kids, when I was thinking about having kids, when I was in my 40s, or in my late 30s, I was with living with a man. And I thought, mm, you know, maybe I, should, maybe I should have kids, you know. It didn't happen. Um, and I'm glad because I think if I had kids, I would um, have had to deal with this earlier and I wasn't ready yet. Um, I, cause I would have, and then I wouldn't have been able to achieve all the things that I achieved in my life. I would have had to spend all my time dealing with my mental health problems so I could be a good mother. Hmm. And I think, I think being a good mother would have been so important to me that I would have done that. And then I probably wouldn't have been able to achieve what I achieved. So, and also I don't believe in regrets. I think they're a waste of time. Hmm. Well, <laughs> in which case you're going to love this last question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you are 75 years old now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you just said a moment ago, you're a little mellower, you're a little happier these days. Do you still have that zealous fire in the belly to fight the next good fight? Totally. <laughs> you know what? When, uh, when I got a tweet from Joe Cressy, who's my counselor, that said that for Thanksgiving, uh, that the new rule is going to be that you can't, the bubbles are finished. Do you remember that? Yeah. The bubbles are finished. This was a few weeks ago. The bubbles are finished. You can only be with people in your household. And I said, what? Like not even mention that there is like a percentage of the population that's single. Most of them lives alone. Most of them women. And I looked it up and it's seven, it was 17%. That was in Canada and Toronto. It's 32% of people. I, I can't even believe that stat, but I read it in the mainstream media, so it must be true. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, a lot of people are single and they didn't even think of that. It made me really mad. And I so I immediately tweeted Joe Cressy and I guess other people did too because they changed it. But so I felt that fire then and, I, and I'm starting to feel it a bit around the long-term care stuff. And I and for sure I feel a black. I went to all those big Black Lives Matter demonstrations. That's what pulled me out of my funk. You know, for me, uh, fighting to to make the world a better place that's healing. You know, all my activism has been healing. And when I went on those demonstrations, and they were so beautiful, they were so diverse, and young black women leading them, and great politics and part of a global movement. Oh, it made me so feel so good and took me out of my funk completely. So I still have that passion for social justice. And that's what, you know, it's what gives me fire, gives me energy. Yeah. Well, we are happy to remind people that they should keep an eye out for Judy versus Capitalism, which is the movie about your life. Uh, and as I say, I've known you for decades and yet I learned so much new about you that I didn't know. Uh, in that you documentary. Read my book too. Uh, Heroes that, that, in my head is my book. <laughs> that'll be next on my agenda. Very okay, good. good. We're so glad you could spare some time for us tonight on TVO, Judy. You be well, okay? My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario, and by viewers like you. Thank you.